Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for coming again. I have a super awesome author today. I have read her book, her first book, Sinister Magic, in one of her series. And I was actually, I knew I would enjoy it, but I've never read just outright dragon or epic fantasy. It has been a long time for me. And I've read it and absolutely loved it. I actually finished it two days ago and I already want the second book. So thank you so much. It is none other than the Lindsay Baroka. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. I want to get straight into it. What is it like to live in Bend, Oregon? I've never been that side of America. So tell me what I need to know. Sure. We are out west. I'm about three hours from Portland, Oregon. This is kind of a tourist town. It, I moved here after I was making a full-time living uh, as an author, so I didn't have to find a job locally. Um, but there's skiing. We've got a good ski mountain. We've got rafting, lots and lots of hiking, uh, kayaking, almost any outdoors thing you can think of. Uh, lots to do if you were into that stuff. And pretty good restaurants and food, too. So. Amazing. Are you a skier? <laughs> I'm not good, but I enjoy it. It's so expensive that I don't go that often. Like, I think you have to go like all the time to get really good, but I got to the point where I could do like the black diamonds, some of them. What is, what is the black diamond? You can tell I'm not a skier. <laughs> oh, it's like uh, easy is green and then blue is intermediate and then advanced is black diamond. And then there's double black diamonds for the people that like to kill themselves going down like straight <laughs> vertical stuff. Well, if you're on the black, it sounds like you're quite confident. <laughs> I, I'm more comfortable on the intermediate. I want to, let's get straight into your books because I was, I knew I would enjoy your book. I didn't realize how much and it, it takes me a while to really get sucked into a world. And I absolutely fell in love with your world. Your writing is amazing. Um, I was often, when I was flicking through the book, I was often looking up what certain creatures were. And I absolutely love that because it just, it created a completely different world that I had not entered before. And so genuinely, I'm super excited to get into book two. I'm going to start reading that tonight. Now, you've written over 60 books. So take me back to the start how why where did you start and how did you find the publishing process well um i am glad that you enjoyed the first book i i hope you if you continue on you keep enjoying them um so i was an only child uh, we did a lot of road trips for swim meets i was a swimmer as a kid and uh lots of road trips in the back of the station wagon hours and hours around the state to get to different swim meets and i just read all the time in the back of the car and at home and i i loved you know, immersing myself in these made up worlds. And I liked writing too, or at least the idea of it. I was not good at finishing things. I always would write something and then it would get kind of hard, you know, and I'd forget about it. And later I'd start something new, get a new idea. So it really took me, to, gosh, I was about in my early thirties before I you know, I joined a writing workshop in my twenties and got a little more serious at that point, wanted to try to start finishing things. And I, I saw other people getting published and, you know, selling stories. So that sort of motivated me to like get serious. I was like, I'm just as good as they are <laughs> and, and try to finish things. And I finally published my first novel at the end of 2010. And, you know, the last 10 years I've been quite prolific. I didn't start out that way. As you can see, as I said, it took a long time to finish uh, one that I thought was good enough to publish. Um, about seven years to finish the first one I published, but now I write a book every couple months and it's um, since 2012, it's been my full-time job. That's crazy. So to think that in only two years, you were able to turn this into a full-time, not only passion, but career, but to write within that time, 60 novels is a huge feat. What was, did you, when you first published, did you go traditionally published? Did you go indie published? And what were your reasons for it? How did you find it? I had originally planned to query agents and go the traditional route, but it was at about the same time I got my first Kindle and I started looking online and seeing some success stories from other people who had gone that route and they were posting their sales numbers. And I'm not a very patient person. So that was sort of the thing that appealed to me most is I could finish a book, have it, have somebody edit it, you know, get some cover art and you could publish it the same month that you finished it basically, as opposed to traditional publishing where like I had queried agents and it was taking months to even get like back requests for manuscripts or even have them say, no, we're not interested. I was like, wow. And then even if you got an agent, as I had friends in my workshop that 
did and then they would work you know shop the manuscript around and maybe two years later they still hadn't found an editor that wanted to get it so you could be back at the starting block without you know having lost all that time so I almost right away after I got the Kindle and saw gosh this will be easy I'll just upload this to the online stores I went for it and I, I have no regrets now I know I be, became a full-time author a lot sooner than I would have if I had gotten a deal at all, there's no guarantee with a uh, traditional publishing, you have to be picked. You can't just do it yourself and uh, make it happen. So when you hit publish on your first book, what happened after that? Was it quite a quick snowball effect? Did you find that almost immediately people had jumped into worlds and loved it? Or did you, did you have to kind of, not hustle, hustle's the wrong word, but did you really have to expand and learn how to market and find the readers that you knew would love your books. How did you go with that? All of that. It definitely was not overnight success. I was, uh, you know, I'd sold a few copies kind of to friends and like, oh, will you follow me on Twitter? And, you know, I, I think I bought your book, so you should buy my book. The first thing I did that really helped me is I had a short story that I'd written for an anthology, but it didn't get accepted. And it featured the main two characters in my first novel. This was my Emperor's Edge series. And they had good chemistry oh. and banter. And I thought, well, that's a, you know, a good introduction to my characters. And so I wrote that one, I think, or I had, I had written it, but I got a cover for it. And then I put an excerpt for book one in the back of that short story. And then I made the short story free and sent it out to uh, Barnes and Noble and, and the various bookstores that, that were willing to list something for free. And so a lot of people checked that out. And then some of them, oh, they, you know, they wanted to find out the, how the characters had came to meet and get to know more of them. So they then bought the first book and so that was sort of the first thing I did that helped. And then when I had more books in the series out, I made the whole first book free. And so that's something I often do at any given time now, a lot, of, especially with my older series that I'm not really actively promoting and advertising and paying for ads on. Um, I'll just make the first book free. And then if they like that, there's like maybe seven more that they can go on and buy at full price. So that's happy to give away the first one in order to get a fan that, that will go on and buy the other ones. And that's quite smart too, because especially with when you're saying the short story, I know that a lot of authors have found huge success in creating a short story and offering it exclusively to uh, email subscribers. Um, and I, I think it is, it's such a good idea. So it's interesting now that you still continue to do that. I guess with the backlog of 60 books, um, it kind of, it really does offer something for free for them to come into your world and then you've, you've trapped them they're done there after that because your book is so good so they're definitely going to be a fan I just know that um one book I am obviously interested in and I want to know where you gathered the inspiration from was Sinister Magic where where did that begin sure now I don't usually write contemporary fantasy with you know stuff set in our world but with dragons and elves and things I usually write more of the Star Wars galaxy far far away or kind of like Lord of the Rings a completely made up different world but I had the idea for the character she was kind of inspired by there's a movie about 20 years old called Gross Point Blank and the main character is a hitman but he's kind of going through this existential crisis and he's talking to his therapist all throughout the movie and I was like that's the best part of the movie that's hilarious so I thought let me do this with a female character you know in a fantasy setting and so she's dealing with some issues of her own and you know talking to a therapist and I just thought that would fit more into a kind of modern setting rather than trying to do that in kind of a made-up world where therapy might not be much of a thing yet so I you know it, it opens with her on the side of a cliff right climbing down and she gets a call from her doctor so that's I sort of had that first scene come to me and, and just built the first story from that. One thing that I love about Sinister Magic is the wit in it. It's quite funny. Um, and also one thing that I was questioning is how much research do you have to put in regards to when you talk about weapons or when you were even talking about um, she was controlling a submarine and things like that, do you put research into that or do you by chance have ex-military experience or know somebody that does to put the finer detail in it? So I'm not by any means an expert on weapons. I, do, I did do four years in the army. That's kind of how I, it is how I paid for college. So I've got a little bit of the, like, I feel like I get the, like the relationship between her and Colonel Willard, you know, I knew it's like, I knew people just like Willard in the army. Uh, so that helps. 
I did fire, you know, we had to qualify with an M16. So I fired weapon, you know, firearms, but um, not, no sword stuff. <laughs> That's all just kind of, uh, I took Taekwondo for a few years as a kid. So sometimes I can kind of see the, you know, unarmed combat stuff playing out well enough to fake it <laughs> but that, that's usually how it is I don't get really specific I, I did look up the weapon that Val has it's kind of a modified I can't even remember this in my notes I knew when I researched it but um she's got like a semiotic pis German pistol that's at least inspired by that so I made sure to kind of model it after that actual weapon and, and try to have it fire the same way that's amazing because I did really appreciate throughout the book because I know a lot of people will go over those finer details. So I definitely was questioning if you had any ex-military because it's like, this is very specific. She knows what she's talking about. Um, one thing that I found, which I thought was really awesome, I came across your YouTube channel, which I love because you also talk about upcoming releases and inspiration behind particular books. And another thing that I found on there was you offer your audio books on there, uh, specifically for Sinister Magic series for free, um, which is amazing. I wanted to know why you decided that because I know a lot of authors would be apprehensive to do something like that because they would be used to the route of, you know, receiving money from Amazon or when it goes wide. So was your line of thinking more so, one, I want to make this available to as many readers as I can, and two, because you get monetized on YouTube as well. So you do, if they do read it, listen through it, you, you get an income from that as well. Right. It was, the, it was one of those things where I had actually got in YouTube premium myself last summer. And I went from kind of like, I really didn't do YouTube much at all before that because I hated the ads. They're just so obnoxious, <laughs> let's face it. Um, so, but once I got the premium, you know, it got rid of all the ads. And also I could just put my phone in my pocket and the videos would play like a podcast. And I just found myself using it all the time, like replacing podcasting with listening to content people put up on YouTube. And one day I decided to check, I wonder if there's any audiobooks on here. And there were a lot of pirated audiobooks. <laughs> you could tell because it's the channel is not the author or the publisher. So, you know, it's just somebody that pirated a copy from Audible. And I thought, well, well there's a lot of people listening to these. Uh, so I decided I'd put sort of the same philosophy that first helped me start selling books was make the first one free. So I put up a couple of like a novella, a short story, and then Sinister Magic and book one in another series. And at that point, um, they actually gained traction pretty quickly and were starting to appear when people search for like urban fantasy audiobook, which is it's hard on Amazon and the bookstores anymore to be seen because there's so much competition. You have to pay to advertise your book and compete with other authors for clicks. So I was like, wow, this is basically free at this point as far as getting visibility. And I saw that I was getting enough watch hours and subscribers to uh, apply to the Google AdSense. Uh, the ads myself, which even though I'm not a big fan of them as a watcher of videos, I, I decided, well, let's just try this. And I only put, I put like one skippable ad in every hour. So it's not like as many as YouTube recommends that if they do the, you know, if you go by what they recommend, they'll put like one every three minutes. And <laughs> it's like, goodness, I actually wanted people to listen to the books. And I saw that that was actually making some money. So I decided to, you know, keep putting up more and I've got six books now in the Death Before Dragon series and I put up all five in the other series Agents of the Crown and I actually also saw an increase in sales of my audiobooks because uh, I put the links to everything you know under they let you put however many links you want in the description for the videos so people could go on and you know if they didn't want to wait for the next one they could get go buy it or they I have a lot of other books on audio too so even if they go by some check out some other series that I don't a lot of them I don't have the rights to put up on YouTube because they're either with a publisher or they're exclusive with Audible um, but I get money if they buy the book so it's been a kind of a win either way I've gotten money from the ad revenue which is about half uh, from ads and half from the split that I receive from YouTube premium subscribers that listen and then I've made more sales since I started putting the audiobooks on YouTube. So that's all I was hoping for was like a little more visibility. And hey, if I can make some extra sales, that's always great too. I want to, so you just mentioned before publishers. I want to know for you, because you are very successful in what you do. And success is defined differently by everyone individually. At what point did you think, wow, I've actually met like, 
I'm here. This is what I'm doing now. Was it any particular contract you signed or was it doing it full time? What was the moment for you? I'm still not sure. I feel like <laughs> that authors always have like imposter syndrome, I think. But I, I certainly felt like, wow, I could probably do this as a career. Uh, when I started, you know, making enough each month that it was like more than I used to make at my day job. And I was able to sustain that. I, I waited a while before, you know, just jumping right to like, I'm going to be a full-time author. Mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't, you know, in eight years, I mean, it helps that I'm so prolific for sure. That's uh, not everybody wants to write that fast or, or can, but it's something that for me, I've gotten faster with time. You know, it's just, like I said, I didn't start out fast. I started out not finishing anything. So it was just kind of a process and you just get a little more practice and need less editing and, and stuff like that as you do more of it. But yeah, so I guess going full time was sort of a, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm making some money. This is like the coolest job ever to write stories for a living. No complaints, really. You are also a USA Today bestseller. And I am curious, one, what book or books should I say was that for? And when did you find out you're on the list and how did you celebrate? That was actually accidental. And I can't claim to be anything special there. It was, um, I put together the first three books in my Dragon Blood series. Uh, that's an epic kind of steampunky epic fantasy series uh, several years ago. And I got a BookBub ad, their big promo site that sends out newsletters full of books. And they're pretty hard to get, but they have a big reach. So authors are always happy to get an ad. And for whatever reason, that one, uh, when I got the ad, it just, I made it 99 cents too. So it was a good deal. It connected with enough people. They were like, yay, dragons, fantasy, let's go buy that. So I've never had this happen with another book, but that particular one sold six or 7,000 copies that week between the book bub. And then just, uh, I think I was promoting it to uh, online because it was a newly reduced price. Um, but yeah, I actually found out a couple months later because I saw another author talk about how he'd gotten on the list, uh, but and he'd done like promo stacking the book bub ad and, and some other ads. And I'm like, I think I sold that many books. So I went back to like January of that year and uh, there it was, it was only for a week, but uh, I had made their, their, their list. So, <laughs> and um, these days I tend to make most of my stuff exclusive to Amazon when I launch it, just because there's a lot of promotional perks if you do that. And then I later put them out in the other stores. So you can't actually get on any lists if you're only in one bookstore. At least two have to report to like USA Today and, and New York Times bestseller list and those things. So I haven't made it again for a while. I think I did it with uh, another box set later, but uh, that was the first time and it was kind of cool. What would you say some of your other accomplishments have been throughout the things that you didn't think would happen and they did and you're just so proud that you were able to achieve that I think a lot of actually it's just more personal stuff than any you know anybody saying like hey here's an award or something I, I just the fact that I went from never finishing anything to finishing my first book that was like a really big deal you know, for me as a non-finisher and then finishing that first series you know, I was really happy when I wrote the last one. It was a little sad to say goodbye to the character, but I felt like I actually done a good job wrapping it up. You know, you never know, like I, as a reader, you know, yourself or watcher of TV, TV, sometimes they open all these loops and have all these things going on and you get to the end and you're like, well, that was disappointing. <laughs> but um, I, I appreciated the ending and, and the fans seemed to like it. So I've been, I think, more proud of those kind of things. Uh, maybe just because I haven't gotten a Netflix deal or anything super big yet, but um, that's that's what I've been uh, happy to kind of continually write fan, you know, write books that the fans really seem to enjoy, and I, and I got a lot of nice emails from people and interactions online. Out of the sixty or so books that you've written, what has been your favorite book to write, and why? Can I only choose one? I can only choose one. <laughs> <laughs> can I choose a series? You can, okay, yes, yes, you can choose this <laughs> I might say, uh, you know, and this changes, it's, it's like the most recent stuff tends to be just more stuck in your head so you remember it. But uh, a couple of years ago, I guess I finished a science fiction series called The Star Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I think the hero in that one was just the most geeky, like non-heroic guy who was not into guns. He was a roboticist. You know, he had to solve all his problems with like robots and computer hacking. And he had seizures when he went into space. So he was very not a Han Solo or even a Luke Skywalker type. And all the characters in that were kind of 
more Big Bang Theory geeky characters than action heroes. And it was a fun series for me to write because I'm a geeky person too. And it, I think a, a lot of the characters really connected with readers that are also maybe a little bit on that side and, and not as not the heroic types or the popular kids. So I think that particular series I had a lot of fun with uh, and there was a lot of humor in it too. But uh, again, I, I think I ended that one pretty well and I really liked the way it all came together. So I want to actually talk a little bit about science fiction. I personally am not um, a science fiction reader yet. Um, I will probably give one of yours a go because I love your writing. What kind of research do you do for that? As you were just saying, he's going out in space, he's having seizures, he's hacking. Do you do a lot of research for that? Or are you secretly an undercover hacker yourself? Like where, where are we on this, on this bar? <laughs> No, that's the probably the most hand wavy um, is the the hacking stuff because I don't know anything about it. I'm like, oh, he downloaded some software and <laughs> took care of that. Um, for the space stuff, I there's a guy actually on YouTube, Isaac Arthur. He's got an awesome channel. It's huge. And I so I've listened. You know, my first series, I didn't really have any science, and it. it was very Star Trek, Star Warsy. No, oh, they just have artificial gravity, and they can just go from planet to planet, like that you know so I tried to do a little more research for the second one even though I'm still writing very inspired by like Star Trek and Star Wars and stuff like that where there's not a whole lot of science it's just sort of space you know opera stuff you know it's very just adventure in space but I, I try to get some of this stuff in there and I listen to a lot of his videos uh, NASA has a good podcast full of stuff like talking about getting sick in space how very common <laughs> you know how how hard it is to adjust to get up there in zero g and then even adjusting when you get back down to the ground after you've been up there for a while it can be quite difficult our bodies were not really meant for that so it's just kind of a rough environment for the human body. So definitely, you know, I love podcasts and, and like the YouTube videos for kind of just learning things casually while you're out walking the dogs or whatever. I, not necessarily reading giant nonfiction books, which can be a little heavy and slow to read. So that's kind of my way to get a foundation in something when I want to get research. Like with that one, that series, I tried to start listening to those podcasts and things a couple of months before I started so that I wasn't having to stop necessarily while I was writing to go look things up. You have to do some of that. But uh, so that's, that's how I like to kind of learn, I guess. What three tips would you offer for viewers who are currently writing the first or maybe the 10th um, in genre, like in fantasy and science fiction? Because when you start creating very different worlds, you really have to stick to your rules. Um, and that is often when people are writing their first uh, book in this genre, they struggle a little bit with that. So what would your three top tips be for anyone who's delving into these world building genres? We'll definitely make kind of a story Bible or series Bible, you know, basically just keep notes as you go. I didn't really do that for my first series and everything from eye colors of characters to, you know, maybe plot ideas you had or things you wanted to go back to, just keep notes. You know, I think with our first series, it, things are stick better in your mind, but after you leave it for a while and come back, you'll wish you had made notes for yourself. And then um, these are genres where series are really popular. So it's not that you can't be successful writing standalone novels, but I would, if you're at all inspired by series and like to do, you know, ca recurring characters, those are uh, easier to sell because once you get them hooked on book one, they want to read all the books with those characters. And that also makes it easier with the marketing. Um, both because you can afford to spend more advertising book one or put more time into it. If there are potentially $20, $30 more of books or more that they can go on and buy, as opposed to just maybe you're selling one book alone for $4.99, you can only afford to advertise a little bit. And it's tough to, uh, to sell a book. And <laughs> especially now we have to pay like 75 cents or something at click and a click doesn't necessarily turn into a sale. So series are good, uh, not only for that, but, you know, just people fall in love with them and then they start talking about the characters and that kind of thing. Uh, and like, oh, go ahead. No, you, you continue. Well, I was just going to say also, it's really good, whether you're traditionally published or you're self-publishing, uh, especially early on to try to connect with other authors in your genre that are probably maybe the same area level you're at as far as sales. Like the, the people I met in my online writing workshop and got to be friends with, uh, like they beta read my stories and I beta read their stories. So we helped each other, you know, find plot errors and, you know, things that didn't seem consistent and that kind of thing. 
And then those are the same people that as you're all starting to publish your books, you can help each other a little bit with marketing. Maybe, you know, if you enjoy each other's work, you can mention them to like your newsletter subscribers or your fans on social media. So it's good to, I as an introvert have a hard time with any type of networking, but you know, if you can reach out a little bit to the other people that are kind of coming up through the ranks with you, then uh, that can be beneficial for you all as you go forward. So would you, do you do a lot of signing events and things like that? I do not as a, <laughs> it's kind of a hard, not only am I an introvert, but I'm not really a, I guess that's just to say an introvert, not that great at conventions and like going up to strangers or talking to people very, I find it very uncomfortable and awkward. So I have not done very many of those things. I've done a couple of writers conferences, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, And then this, past year of course with COVID nobody's been doing that so I've been thankful that my income doesn't rely on me going out and hand selling books at conventions because um, I know some people really enjoy that really hanging out with readers with like-minded people but I'm always like ah people (laughs) I find it just kind of stressful to uh, be in those situations with strangers (laughs) even if they're fans of your work it's sort of just like you know you got to be on for the whole time you're there and it's uh, very draining as an introvert interesting because I, I envisioned quite honestly I mean I've envis- envisioned your table already and the, we have a um, event here called Supernova it's very um, like common like comic-con things like that so you have your so I'm a bit of a nerd also so I love like anime and manga and things like that and people cosplay and your books would sell so well at these events that's just why I thought I would ask because I'm just like I can see you would do so well um Speaking of being an introvert, did you find it took you a while to gain the confidence in what you wrote and what you were selling? Because I feel like it's a gradual build for authors. I know when I first started my career, I wasn't very confident in what I was producing because I still felt like a little baby author. I wasn't sure what I was doing. And if people liked it, if people liked me, at what point did you have a challenge with that gaining that confidence? And then when did you overcome it? I think that belonging to a writing workshop really helped with that. Um, just because some of the people who were reading and, you know, critiquing my stuff as I was doing theirs, they seemed to really enjoy the characters. Like they found plenty to critique and suggest, but um, they seem to enjoy the characters quite a bit. And I always, I got the sense that if I could just get people to try my books, that the characters were enough fun, had enough personality and quirkiness that people found them appealing, kind of no matter what they were doing. I mean, I try to write a good story too. Um, but And I did get some, sell some short stories and things like that when I was doing the workshop before I decided to self-publish. So that kind of helped a little bit too, the fact that I was able to make some sales that made me think, okay, well, at least the writing I know is good enough that um, people aren't just saying, oh, this is horrible, it passed. <laughs> so that by the time I self-published the first novel, I was, you know, I, I had that belief that you know, maybe it would be trash, maybe the reviews would be horrible, but I thought if people got into it and gave it a shot, they would uh, enjoy the characters and want to keep reading. I won't say that I'm completely like, I just think everything's awesome and I'm sure it'll be great. You, especially when you start a new series, you, you always have a little trepidation like, well, will the fans like this? Should I just have written more about the characters I know they already like? Uh, especially in my case, because I like to kind of jump around like doing this space opera, the sci-fi, doing more epic fantasy. And then the contemporary fantasy was kind of a change for me too. So it can be a big ask to when you jump to different genres to get the readers who maybe they usually only read epic fantasy or they only read urban fantasy to uh, come along with you to a new genre. So I have some confidence, but I also find it's helpful just not to read reviews because you'll you can just find soul crushing things in there even if and as a human we always focus on the negative you know it's like they're gonna be like nine glowing reviews and you'll be like that one that's one star those are the words that are like burned into your mind and you'll be bitter about them still a year from now so uh, I try to distance myself a little bit from that just so that I because I know that that's a weakness I'll be like I'll be crushed (laughs) after I read that stuff all oh, right, that's so accurate. <laughs> like, that's so relatable. I was like, yes. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about fans. We're talking about readers. What has been your most memorable reader interaction? 
You know, since I don't really do the in-person stuff, I don't have anything like that, but I've just, I've gotten quite a few emails from people who have had something really rough going on in their life or they've lost someone or it's just been a really hard year. So, and those have like just been really touching to me. And I'm so glad like this last year, I think it was really hard for a lot of people. I got a lot of emails like, thank you for writing these funny books and entertaining me during this year when I'm stuck at home and, you know, somebody's been sick or something. And so those are the kind of things that I, you know, of course I enjoy getting paid and selling books, but it's also nice to know that the fans really enjoy them. And that, you know, if somebody says you're their favorite author, that, you know, you know how much people read, that's really meaningful, I find. Speaking of favorite author, who is your favorite author? Who do you follow? Um, Lois McMaster Bujold who writes mostly sci-fi, though she's been doing more fantasy lately. Um, her Vor Kosigan series, I always recommend to people. That's some of the first sci, because there's a lot of sci-fi out there that's very techy, written by <laughs> written by tech nerds, which is what you would expect. You know, it's what you, why wouldn't it be? And I've always been someone, I just like the characters. That's why I liked Star Wars and Star Trek and uh, Stargate, SG-1, things that were really more about the characters and their relationships, uh, just kind of in a sci-fi setting. I never cared if... Uh, the lasers or whatever were explained perfectly scientifically correctly so and i read her stuff and she's actually really smart and her science is great but her characters are wonderful uh i highly recommend them there's humor in them and so she was an author i've read I, that i was like oh this is how i want to write science fiction it was like an made it okay for me to write something like that versus um being intimidated and feeling like I had to write this really science foundational kind of material that you had to have a PhD in physics in order to write this. What would you say? So obviously one of the the big efforts, especially when starting off as an independently published author, is marketing. Well, and you've mentioned a couple of times now ads as well. So I'm curious as to what ads, what platform, whether it's uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google, what do you focus on? And on top of that, uh, what's your three top marketing tips for fellow writers? So it kind of changes from year to year, what's fashionable and what's in, what's working. You know, for the last couple of years, Amazon ads have been kind of my go-to. It's competitive because you're bidding against other authors. So that's where the series helps. Uh, Like I said, you can afford to spend more getting people to pick up book one if there are more books and if your read through is good and there you find that people are going from one to two to three and sticking with the series. So that's sort of what I do. Um, Some people love Facebook ads. I tend to use them around a book launch or especially if a new series, I'll just go ahead and try them. I never feel like I'm that great at them or unless it's like a 99 cent book or something, I don't feel like the the response is all that great. Um, If it's a really good deal, I've had them do well. But if it's like a 4.99 full full price book, I find that for me, Amazon ads are more likely to convert. Uh, And sometimes it helps to, uh, you know, I've been doing some of my series exclusive with Amazon. So they're in Kindle Unlimited. So that kind of makes the advertising easier to make it work because you kind of win whether they borrow it or they buy it as long as they borrow it and read it. (laughs) And you've got a a decent number of pages for them to read. Um, I do for a lot of my series that are not exclusive. I still love the first uh, first book free in the series. I find that that kind of keeps the things from just falling off a cliff and disappearing like enough people are still looking for free stuff in in the various stores you know I'm on Google Play and Kobo and Barnes and Noble and all the main bookstores with those series and every you know every now and then I I will advertise that free first book um, e-reader news today free book see the various sponsorship sites they don't cost too much I book bub I try to get every now and then They're, they're tough to get into so I'm always willing to give away something for free. I mean, sometimes I even do the whole, like I have three book, one, two, three bundles in some of my series that I'll kind of go alternate. They'll be like full price or $7.99 or something. And then I'll make them free for a while and kind of go back and forth. Um, so that's something I do. I talked about before, if you can connect with other authors in your genre. I don't do this as much anymore. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have gotten to the point where I sell enough books and I have enough people on my newsletter that if I send out a newsletter, I get a lot of replies. So it's a lot of, I then feel I have to reply. (laughs) So it's a lot of work, but earlier on, you know, I would do more of the newsletter swaps with other authors in my genre where um, they would promote my book to their newsletter and I would mention their book to my newsletter. You know, it helps you want something that's like, 
same genre, um, pretty close to your stuff. And that can be great if you can get other authors to uh, mention your book in newsletters, always a good thing. So I, I, I only stopped doing that because it's just, I, now I only email with new releases or like uh, if I write a short story or something, a free something for my readers on my blog, I'll, I'll let them know. But I know that when I send out a newsletter, it's like, okay, I'm then going to have to spend however many hours answering emails. So I don't do as much of that anymore, but that's a great uh, thing to do. You know, just reaching out to other authors in your genre that are kind of, hopefully you actually like their writing. So you're comfortable recommending their books. Um, you know, not necessarily trying to get the big sellers, if uh, you're not a big seller yourself, but other people that are kind of rising up through the ranks are, are generally more uh, open to that kind of thing because they're in the same place you are. Yeah. What Do you have a Facebook group for your readers? I just do the Facebook page mm -hmm. and I find that's pretty fairly popular. It's worth doing. Whenever I mention sales or a new, post a new book there, I get quite a few people. A lot of times you get people there who won't necessarily sign up for your newsletter. So it's good to do both. Uh, as far as groups, I tried, I know some authors really like them and some join together and do groups. Uh, I just don't want to take the extra time. Uh, maybe it's a bit of an introvert versus extrovert thing too, but I'm like, wow, that's a time sink. I think some people probably hire assistants to do it, uh, to admin, you know, make sure everything stays okay. And I certainly, if, if you enjoy it, go for it. I've just kind of resisted it because it's like, ah, extra work, interacting with people. Um, and then I, you know, you have to kind of monitor people like start chewing on each other in the comments, you know, or arguing about something, the fandom, you know, or something else. And it's like, oh man, too much work. <laughs> what would you say that your greatest challenge and greatest accomplishment has been so far in your career? Well, I think I already mentioned just kind of finishing, starting to finish things after I had so many, <laughs> so many years of not doing that, kind of getting serious and finishing things. And then I'm, you know, pleased that over 10 years now, I've managed to consistently put out novels, you know, just very regularly. I think that's really helped me build up a, a fan base. It's tough when uh, you get excited and you publish like five novels and then you disappear for three years. It's really tough to have a career like that. And you know, I think this is true with traditional publishing too. When you look at the big names now that started like in the eighties, you know, Stephen King, I think even started in the seventies. They've just consistently written and published novels every year. And it cannot be like, you can't sit, realize, you know, I think people want the instant success and they always talk about people like that. And it's like, you have to realize they've been doing it for like 40 years and doing it every, you know, putting out multiple novels a year. And that's tough. You know, you have life gets in the way. Sometimes you have strange pandemics. Uh, we have wildfires here on the West side of the United States. That was some big drama this past year. So it's, it's, I guess, could the consistency as boring as that is, I feel like that's kind of a key to success and I'm glad I've been able to do it. What would you say your greatest challenge has been? Um, like I said, was finishing things. I don't know why that was so hard, but I, there was years where I was like playing World of Warcraft and not writing. So I think I actually had to stop the gaming stuff. I was a very big uh, addict. You know, I started playing MUDs back in the 90s on the BBS with the modem that you had to dial up. So realizing what I kind of had to give up in order to start accomplishing the things I wanted to, that was... Um, a challenge and um, I had to go cold turkey. I found out I'm not really a person who can just be like, oh, an hour a day. I'll just let myself do that because I would be on there all weekend. <laughs> so I guess that's uh, probably for everybody. That's probably true for everybody, figuring out what you have to give up in order to get what you want. Figure out what you need to prioritize. Speaking of consistency then, what does your daily routine look like? Do you have a magic formula that works for you? My favorite days are just when I can just write, you know, some days there's a lot of admin stuff, you know, everything from emailing to arranging cover art to work going back and forth with your editor for things to uh, marketing. But I try to, when I'm writing a first draft, I try to have most of the days in the week be writing days or editing days. And so my favorite day is just sort of get up, you know, have the coffee, take the dogs for a walk, have breakfast start writing. I, I have horrible ergonomics as I usually write in bed with my laptop. The dogs love it. They're just all over the blankets with me uh, or the couch. I almost never, like the desk is for admin stuff. So it's, it's like a less creative place for me for some reason. 
um, you know, work till lunchtime, write some more in the afternoon. I usually have goals of like edit two or three chapters or try to get like 7,000 words written if it's a rough, you know, first draft. Um, by like four or five, I take a break and do some exercise of some kind or another. Walk the dogs again. This is how you, when you have dogs, they're very demanding. They're like children, but they never grow up and move out you know, feed everybody. And then ideally I'm done at that point, but a lot of times I'm not, and I'm to reach my goal. I might do a couple more hours in the evening, but sometimes it's good when I have an appointment or something I have to be at because then I'm better. Like, you know how the, the saying that's like a task will kind of spread to uh, t- fill the entire time allocated to it. So if I have less time, I tend to get real focused more <laughs> better and get done quickly. Um, but the, you know, my favorite days are just when I don't have an appointment or anything going on and I can just write and you don't always get those days, but they're, they're kind of like the happy, the happy times. Uh, I think like a lot of writers, I'm more into the actual writing than the marketing side of things. That's sort of like a grudging thing that you learn you have to do in order to sell books. What is the, the largest goal for you? What is the dream that you're chasing? At this point, I think that um, I would be happy to continue on. I'm trying to trying to sock aside money f- notes so I can be have the retirement fully funded and just at the, get to the point where um, I don't have to write. It's like a choice to write. So that's one goal I'm working toward. I would love to get like have one of my series produced by Netflix or HBO or something like that. So I'm, I'm waiting, you know, like it happens now and then you just need the right person to read it and reach out to you. Um, they'd probably do a horrible job of it because they always kind of <laughs> mangle the characters and everything. But I still that would be like the coolest thing, I think, to see a television, probably TV since I'd write series. But uh, that'd be fun. Do you do you have an agent? at the moment nope nope have you ever have you ever thought about getting one um or or why not so i've talked to a couple of people um they generally want to do the whole shebang they want to like you know try to get your stuff to uh traditional publishing and then they'll try to sell the foreign rights and maybe get hollywood deal if they can but um i've been reluctant to give that give up control especially of the ebooks because it is 70% 70% of the price I listed at. So $4.99 on Amazon or whatever for an ebook. And I get like $3.60 or whatever the math is versus they make so much less traditionally published. You have to sell so many more copies. And not only that, but the, they sell them at $9.99 to $14.99 traditional publishers usually. And it's not like the author has any say. So my poor readers would go from paying $4.99 to having to pay $9.99 for new books. And also that some middle people could get a cut of it, you know, so I, I've been very reluctant to, to do that, but I would happily, I can't produce a TV series by myself, you know, I can publish ebooks by myself, no problem and paperbacks, but uh, for the things like I just sold in the last two, last year, foreign rights for a couple of my series. So that's something I'm happy to do because I'm not going to pay for translations. Those are really expensive. Uh, and in audiobooks, I have a publisher for some of the audiobooks, but I've not really looked for an agent. And then usually a couple of times when I've talked with people, it was sort of like, we see that your book is selling well right now. <laughs> you know, like they didn't even read it, you know, so it's like, oh, we see that this is selling well right now. We, would you be interested in talking? I'm like, well, no, I probably only want to work with someone that would actually like read the whole series and was a fan or at least read the first book. So I'm not, you know, I wouldn't say never, but it's not something I'm trying to pursue right now. What What's up and coming? What are you working on? What are we looking out for this year? So I've just written the first book in a new epic fantasy series. So that is what the main project's going to be for 2021 here. I'm about to start the second one. I'll be publishing the first one soon. I did complete the Death Before Dragon series. I just published the last one mm, just a few weeks ago. So I, I really enjoyed that series quite a bit. And I'm, you know, more than I like, I didn't think I would as much because of the, con, you know, contemporary fantasy is not really my thing. I'm not a super fan as a reader, but I, I liked it. A lot of um, people seem, readers seem to like it. So I'm probably also going to do a spinoff of that at some point with a new heroine. But, you know, I'll have to bring in the existing characters for uh, some cameos and, and stuff. So that may be for later in this year or 2022. I'm so excited. Yeah, you've definitely you've definitely got a reader out of me. I'm like, I, I loved it so much. Um, 
we, you and I, ha- I have a segment called Speed Dating with an author. So you and I are going to go on a romantic date. I have a candle, very <laughs> romantic that way. Um, so first one is, what's one of the clumsiest moments you've ever had? This is the one I told you I wasn't sure I wanted <laughs> to say on a public forum. How many people will watch this video? It's like under a thousand, more than a thousand. <laughs> Unless I just like cut out this bit and then it's like hundreds of thousand. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the thing that comes to mind, because it was like the most horrible thing that happened to me, embarrassment wise, was um, when I, I think I mentioned I was in the army for four years and it wasn't really my thing, but uh, basic training, you go on this like three day let's call it camping it's like a field exercise where you can't use you know you can't go back to the barracks or anything and my that time of the month came a couple of weeks early unexpectedly like that was not regular for me and I was like mortified and I went and asked my drill sergeant who was you would think as a female you know drill sergeant would be understanding and she totally like out of me in, t- in front of the whole company was around like you lo- you didn't come prepared to war you know they pretend you're in war and stuff and I was just so mortified and you know, if I had just asked other women in the unit, which was at what, you know, they helped me out, of course, but, she, you know, I was like, why did I go to her and ask, you know, I think I asked if I could get something from the store or whatever. But anyway, so that was my most uh, embarrassing experience that made me, I've killed that woman several times now as characters in my story. I didn't name them the same name, but I know in my head they were her <laughs> I got you back he was quite awful like we had two drill sergeants and the guy was super cool like I should have gone to him because <laughs> he would have been like oh sure go ahead you know but she was horrible okay that's brutal um, <laughs> I'm glad you've killed her off many times before in your books fabulous if you had to describe yourself in three words what would they be um here's where I need my notes consistent since we talked about that I think quirky, I even have that on my website that I write about quirky characters, because that's all I can write about. I can't really write about normal people. And um, I like to think I'm funny. I'm not so funny in person, but when you're writing, you have a little more time to like craft out things. And your characters get to say all the witty comebacks that like you as a person, you'd be t- you're too embarrassed or you remember like five minutes later, you're like, oh, I should have said that. That's what I should have said. You know, when you're writing, you can uh, you can let your characters get all the lines that you can never think of quickly enough when the moment demanded it. What is the best song that describes you? So I actually like rap. So there's a guy called NF and he's kind of a, he's actually, I uh, definitely go check him out. He's very, um, I don't know if he's like a Christian rapper if, or not, but he doesn't, there's not a lot of cussing, but he's really good with like the wordplay. He's kind of, I would think similar to Eminem, but without as much uh cussing and <laughs> hose and stuff like that but he's got a song called just being me and um i really like it he's got a line in there like uh, i think it's something like i i don't rap because i want millions of people to like me i rap for the millions of people that are like me so you know kind of with writing i try to write for the people who are also quirky and maybe <laughs> a little geeky and uh weren't the popular kids in school just being me oh that's awesome i'm gonna have to listen to it after this i haven't heard it before but i will have a listen uh, what is your life motto? So I should have looked this up before because you gave me the questions ahead of time. But um, I, so I don't know who said this, but the quote is basically like the rational person adapts himself to the world around him, but the irrational person adapts the world to suit him. Therefore, all progress depends on the irrational person. And I, I'm sure I kind of mangled it, but that was sort of the point. Like it's the people that, uh, you know, you have to like if you want a career, if you want to be self-employed, anything like that, you have to be willing to like go out there and create, do what you need to do, not necessarily just follow, follow in the footsteps of others, because sometimes that doesn't work. So it's okay to be like irrational and, and try to like change the world to suit you. <laughs> what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not many people know about? Yeah, th- even with the questions ahead of time, I wasn't really sure how to answer this. I I don't hide that I play tennis. I've got a pretty wicked uh, backhand slice, but uh, that's so cool. You won't, you won't know that until you play me. I well, a challenge accepted. I, <laughs> I I'm a competitive person. I'm not necessarily good. I will uh, crap talk, so to speak, a lot. Um, but I'll definitely try. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm not that great either, but uh, especially I haven't been playing much this past year, you know, freaking COVID messing up your tennis game. (laughs) But uh, I look forward to getting back out there hopefully this year. That's so much fun. Well, that is the, that is the end of our speed date. Um, 
I think it went well. You've, you've intrigued me. I would be invested in the second date. So thank you for your time. Um, oh, you're welcome. I appreciate the candle that uh, <laughs> set the ambiance. It's, it's nothing really. You're worth it. Um, <laughs> that's all my questions. I have had a really, really good time. Do you have anything else that you want to uh, let readers know or things that we need to look out for other than the books you've got? Uh, nothing big. If people are watching this and like the audiobooks, they can uh, listen to Sinister Magic and the whole, gosh, I'm getting the whole series up there eventually on, on YouTube for the audiobooks. That's amazing. And definitely check it out. Um, it is such a good book. Uh, and I will continue reading the series. Thank you so much for coming on today. I have had an absolute blast. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me and candling the, you know, <laughs> candling it up. That's totally a word. I am going to love you and leave you. I hope you have an amazing day and hopefully in the next couple of months or year when you've got a new release, hopefully I can get back, get you back on. That would be great. Sounds good. Thank awesome. You. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>